Richard Reeves, in his new book, argues that the modern man and boy is struggling across three domains, in education, in employment, and as fathers. Me and Richard will be in conversation for about 30 to 35 minutes. Um, if you have a question, you can ask your question by clicking on the Ask Question button under the video screen um, and then pressing Send. And please um, get involved on social media by using the hashtag IQ2. Um, the first question for you, Richard, is why is the city of Kalamazoo in southwest Michigan so interesting for policy wonks? <laughs> uh, I should say that Kalamazoo is also interesting to Glenn Miller fans. So those who know their Glenn Miller will know the famous song, I've Got a Girl in Kalamazoo. So if, you're, if you've heard the name, my guess is unless you're a policy wonk, that's the most likely that you will have heard of it. Um, but it's it, it's interesting to policy wonks because it's a city that has had free college for all of its uh, graduating high school seniors. So if you graduate from the high school in that in that city, then you can go to college pretty much anywhere in the state for free, full tuition paid. Um, and, and it's also been very well evaluated. So it's a very generous free college scheme. Uh, but it's also been very well evaluated to see what effect it would have. What, what effect would it have on college completion in particular? And what the, the evaluators found was it had a massive effect on female college completion. So uh, the, the young women in Kalamazoo became about 50% more likely to get a four-year college degree, which was a huge change uh, in, in terms of public policy terms. That's a massive impact. But for men, the number was zero. It had absolutely no impact on the likelihood of uh, of boys and then young men from that uh, city going on to get a four-year college degree. So the equivalent would be a uh, three-year college degree in the UK. And that's a pretty extraordinary fact. And that led me to look at a whole bunch of other interventions that find similar results where you'll see pretty strong effects for girls or women and negative effects or zero effect for boys or young men. And so in a way, that's one of the things that led me to write this book, because we know that there are some issues, say, in education for, for boys and men, but it's sort of rubbing salt in the wounds if then many of the interventions that are being tried to improve education overall are helping girls and women, but not helping boys and men. Mm. So when does this gap in education start between boys and girls, and what are the pos possible causes for it? Uh, well, it starts at the beginning, uh, basically. Mm. I mean, you can't you can't really Cross find a point in the education system. Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, you said in the it depends when you think education starts. I suppose. Sure. I, sure. I, I don't know of any particular good evidence for differences in skills, uh, say, among two year olds. Um, there are differences in behavior among two year olds. So, like two year old boys are much more physically aggressive, for example, than two year old girls and have to be taught not to do that, which is kind of probably evidence that some of that's natural, but that may, maybe that's a subject we'll get onto, Tom. Um, mm. But uh, essentially, from the beginning, at least from when we start measuring it, right? So, as soon as mm. we measure it when they start school and then we measure it again, uh, you know, say at the start of secondary school and then again at the end of you know, GCSEs, A levels, et cetera. Um, and essentially, the gap runs in favor of girls uh, every step of the way. It does get wider at certain points and narrow at other points. So it seems to be a little bit wider at the beginning, maybe narrows a little bit um, up into the early teen years, and then it widens again quite dramatically during the teen years. And so it's pretty wide by the time you get to the end of secondary school. Yeah. And, and what do you think? What are the possible causes for this gap? So I think there's a number of uh, possible speculation, speculations here. I think, I think the main ones are that on average, and maybe we should just preface that almost everything I'm going to say is on average, so I don't have to say it every time because that gets boring, and the distributions overlap. Can we just take, can we take that as given, right? And then sure. <laughs> maybe edit that in later. Um, but on average, boys develop uh, a little bit more slowly. They develop later than girls. Uh, mm. And that's especially true in adolescence because girls hit mm. puberty earlier. And one of the mm. things that does that triggers the development of parts of the brain, uh, especially the prefrontal cortex, which is that's the bit of your brain that says, do your physics homework, don't go to the party. 
That's the mm. bit of your brain that says you should study for these tests rather than just turn mm. up and hope for the best. It's the bit of your brain that says, if I don't do well in these exams, I won't go to college and then I'll struggle in life. So it's future orientation. And that bit of the brain just develops about a year or two earlier in girls. Mm. And so if you have an education system that rewards those sorts of behaviors, which we do, then we should sort of be, we should be surprised if girls weren't ahead. The surprise is that they weren't ahead all along. And the reason they weren't ahead all along is because of sex, sexism. It actually, mm. under conditions where girls and women were actively discouraged from pursuing education, especially higher education, then the natural advantages they had in the education system couldn't be seen. So it's paradoxical mm. that it took the women's movement to expose the ways in which the education system is structured in favor of girls and women, including in this timing, develop, timing way. The other two I'll just mention briefly is one is that teaching is becoming a more female profession over time. And there's some evidence that having male teachers can be particularly beneficial for boys. And so that could be a part of it too. And then the last is that the boys on average tend to do better with more vocational forms of learning than girls. Um, and, and, but most of our spending on education still goes on traditional education. So things like apprenticeships, vocational, you know, vocational training, uh, doesn't get the same investments. And so that tends, that tends to hurt boys a bit more. Sure. Um, and is this education gap um, true across the world, or is it true in certain countries? It's true uh, in all advanced economies. So sure. like one data point would be in every OECD country. Mm. So to the extent that you're economically advanced enough to be in the OECD, then there are more young women than young men with a college degree. Mm. Uh, in every OECD country, I think mm. the last across, I think the last across the line might be Mexico, but um, mm. someone can fact check that for me in real mm. time. Um, but interestingly, even outside the OECD, so I can number striking number of Middle East, Middle Eastern countries, and so on, you are mm. seeing a gender gap in favor of women in some levels. Um, but it's obviously not true in many of the poorer parts of the world. And so, mm. the one of the difficulties with this conversation is that the ways in which women and girls are outpacing boys and men are quite local. So it's, it is typically in advanced economies that we're mostly talking about and recent. Mm. Uh, it's only happened in the last few decades. It's happened spectacularly mm. quickly, but it's happened very mm. recently. And mm. so we wouldn't be having this conversation 40 years ago and we wouldn't be having it still in probably half the countries in the world. Sure. What is red shirting? Redshirting is a, it's a US term borrowed from athletics, which is to delay uh, entry to school for a year or delay entry to a secondary school for a year. So you basically uh, enter whatever the school year is a year older. Mm. And it used to be done mostly for athletic reasons. So in, in the US, it was very often done, and this is particularly true for male sports, um, but just being bigger mm. uh, and stronger. Uh, was going mm. to be to your advantage. So actually, mm. you know, being 19 is helpful when you're playing a contact sport um, mm. than being 18. Everything else equal, you could mm. you could be bigger and you've got a bit more time to train. But now there's now uh, it's been used uh, as a term for academic redshirting. So that's that's the decision to delay entry into school, not because you want your kid to be the best football player or whatever uh, or rugby player, but because you want them to do better at math and better at English and do better in their exams. And so sure. that's really now the main driver of, of what this quotes red shirting phenomenon. Sure. Interesting. Um, in the book, you argue, of course, that, um, the differences between, uh, boys and girls or men and women, um, which explains the differences in terms of education, um, is at least partly because of biology. Um, so what would you say to somebody that says, by insisting on the importance of biology, you are merely um, endorsing something that's been used historically to oppress women? Well, it depends. It depends what mood I was in. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so let's let's say I'm in a conciliatory mood and I'm in a public event. You know, so mm. I, I I'm going to say I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, <laughs> that that is absolutely you no, know, etc. The truth is, I'd say, are you crazy? Mm. Like, like mm. if I'm being candid about it, sure. you know, it's just you and sure. me. It's just you and yeah. me, right? So yeah. I can I can yeah. only see you. I can only see you. <laughs> yeah, on the yeah, yeah, so Let's assume yeah, it's just yeah. you and me. <laughs> yeah. I think, like no. Nobody out there in the real world 
mm. thinks that there aren't some biological differences that mm. have some consequences for things like education. No one who's raised boys or been a boy or met a mm. boy thinks sure. that there aren't some of these differences. Mm. The, the real debate is not, not whether there are differences, it's like how big they are, mm. uh, in what domains and how much they matter. Mm. That's, mm. that's the real that's the real debate. And actually, um, the problem with the whole debate about male and female brains is that it's kind of focused on adults, by which time most of the differences have actually washed out by the time you get mm. to your mid-20s and going forward. What that disguises is the biggest difference is in the timing of brain development, which we just discussed, which does mm. have significant implications for education, right? So mm. even if you don't, even if we can, even if you don't think there's much difference in male and female brains among 28-year-olds, which there isn't mm. much difference. Mm. Um, and not very consequential. Sure. That, that doesn't mean it's true for 14 and 15 year olds. And there, there's no disagreement among neuroscientists at all. Mm. The question is how far it overlaps. So I'd say, and the, the last thing I'll say on this is the thing I find quite frustrating about this debate is acknowledging that nature has a role doesn't make culture less important. Mm. It makes it more important mm. because culture is what determines how and whether and when we express some of these natural differences. Sure. So to acknowledge nature is not to deny culture. It is to elevate mm. culture. Mm. Um, it's, so in that sense, it's, it's, not, it's a completely false binary. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and do you think the factors that explain why boys are struggling in schools relative to girls um, also explains why men are struggling um, in employment relative to women? Or, are they, or is it something different going on? It's mostly something different. So sure. to the extent that boys who struggle in education are going to find it harder in the labor market, mm. and especially now. So, so mm. uh, that, that's obviously, that's a factor. But the main sure. thing that's, that's hit male employment and male wages mm. uh, has been external shocks to the economy. So more sure. free trade, globalization, and more automation, mm. right? And that's mm. nothing to do with the rise of women in the labor market and nothing to do mm. with brain development. And not mm. directly anything to do with the education system, except sure. to the extent that we now need to prepare men for this new world. But, yeah. but actually, it's just what's happened is that traditionally male jobs have just been hit mm. hard by industrialization and free trade. That's the fact. Of course. Of and course. the question then is how quickly, how quickly can men adapt to the new mm. world? And so I think that it's very important to realize that things can happen at the same time without necessarily being the cause of the other. So, for example, the rise of women in the labor market has happened at the same mm. time that men have been hit in the labor market. But mm. it's not but it's not because women have risen that men have fallen. Mm. Other things have happened at the same time, and in particular, mm. deindustrialization. Sure. Um, and, and do you think the struggles of men in, in the labor system is one of the most important factors that explain um, populism? I think that the... The real difficulties that many men are having, right? and mm. especially, I think it's important not to say this is not all men. Right? This yeah. is not typically the men at the top who are actually sure. well, most men are doing pretty well, but working class men. Mm. Uh, let's use that term broadly. Uh, the real problems that they are having, uh, if unaddressed, or in some cases even unacknowledged, create fertile ground for populist mm. movements. Mm. Uh, to the extent that populism... Uh, gets its fuel from grievance, mm. um, gets its fuel from reaction, to the extent mm. that it's reactionary, then I think the unaddressed male problems are really, they are, they are just great fuel for the populist fire. Mm. Uh, and I think we've seen that. I, mean, I think we've seen, like particularly among young Britons, for example, quite a big gender gap on Brexit. Mm. Um, there's a huge gender gap over here in the US from John, mm. Donald Trump's victory. Mm. Um, the rise of the right in East Germany is strongly related to what's happening to a lot of East German men. And mm. so I think that the gender dimension to populism is a strong one uh, and isn't, isn't talked about enough. We know about class, and of course that's mm. probably even more important, but, mm. but I think this, this gender element uh, is huge. But I don't think it has to be. I think that what's mm. happened is because we haven't addressed the problems square on mm. in the mainstream, that's created space. Mm. for more reactionary populists mm. to, to to sort of pick up on that because there are you know if you have real problems that responsible people don't address then irresponsible people are going to exploit them that's a that's mm. a fact of human history i think uh, and i think we're seeing that playing out in this space now yeah but why do you think the um progressive left um view this topic as a zero-sum game um so they would say that focusing on the unique struggles of boys and men 
um, potentially um, distracts us from um, being feminist? Why, why, why do they see it in such terms? I, I think that, uh, again, in a generous mood, I would say that it's because it's happened so fast. Mm. I mean, it's happened so unbelievably quickly that mm. un updating your priors that quickly uh, is just really hard. I mean, the cause of gender mm. equality has basically been synonymous with the cause of women and girls for, I don't know, let's say 10,000 years mm. and has only ceased to be so for, let's say, 40, 30, 40 years. So we're mm. talking about the blink of an eye. Um, and so, and there are many remaining challenges for women and girls. And so mm. I just think it's really hard <laughs> to mm. catch up with such a dramatic uh, social change. And when, we, when you have mm. a situation where we've already talked about the education gaps, but you know, forty percent of British households now have a female breadwinner, mm. and that's just that's just I, I, I don't know what the number was forty years ago, but but it's mm. probably probably quadruple. It's certainly just mm. like it's just a different it's a different world, even to the world I grew up in. You know, I'm only in my early 50s. So this mm. is just an extraordinarily rapid change. Yeah. And and I think there's a sense that like, there's only so much political capital to go around. There's only so much money to go around, right? If we spend this on boys, then it means we're going to spend less of it on girls and women. But what I mm. would say is that in the long run, when boys and men are struggling, that tends to end up not helping women either. Sure. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So we've spoken about um, what the progressive left get wrong about the unique struggles faced by boys and men. What would you say the conservative right, or do they get wrong on this issue? Well, it's a couple of things. I mean, one is we talked a bit about biology mm -hmm. uh, and we've just had a discussion where like, there are some biological differences, like, sure. which is like a, what, which is outside of like some circles were like, well, duh. Um, mm. But the right will sometimes then over overemphasize those. And so there's some mm. as a tendency, I think, to explain gender inequalities too quickly by by resort to a biological explanation. That's, of course, an old mm. story. Mm. Uh, and so th there's a lot of nuance there. But mm. I would say the biggest thing is probably what um, David Willits once described as a tendency among conservatives towards bring backery, mm. which is a great phrase, bring, bring backery. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, don't think I don't think I managed to get that into the book. That was um, uh, from his book about you know, generational inequality. Um, hmm. from a few from quite a few years back now and what it means by that is like conservatives are like we need to bring back x we need to bring back the traditional family bring back hmm. traditional manufacturing jobs hmm. bring back the whatever it is right bring back x yeah. hmm. and i think that when it comes to this issue too often what conservatives will do is to suggest that we can bring back the traditional family hmm. and we can't hmm. it's in the rear view mirror now the mm. women's movement has successfully created a world in which women have much more economic independence, which is a glorious, wonderful thing, arguably the biggest human, you know, the biggest liberation in human history and on some mm. measures. But that means mm. you can't you can't put Humpty back together again. You can't you can't no. rebuild family on the basis of women's economic dependency on men. Mm. That mm. world has gone. And so mm. the trouble is that if you just talk about traditional families, traditional jobs, manufacturing, et cetera, what you're really doing is you're just holding out a false hope. And that mm. doesn't help men adapt. What we mm. actually need to do is help men adapt to the world as it is rather mm. than the world as it was. And conservatives almost always fail to do that. Sure. Um, what, what does um, heal mean? H-E-A-L. What, what, what does that mean? Yes, it's an acronym. Uh, you know, you need a good acronym. As everyone knows, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it's uh, you can't get anywhere, especially especially in policy circles without an acronym. And this one is like the mirror image of STEM. So most people heard cool. of STEM, yeah, uh, science, technology, engineering, uh, and math. Interesting. What most people don't know is that it wasn't originally STEM when mm -hmm. Judith okay. Ramelay went to the National Institute of Health. It was actually SMET, mm. S M E T, and she said, "Oh, I don't like the sound of that. I'm going to change it." So she changed it to STEM. And honestly, the rest is history. Um, uh, we had STEM caucuses. There's been a huge push to get women, women especially into STEM jobs, pretty you know, pretty successfully. Um, Heal is the opposite of that. So it's health, education, administration, mm. and literacy, literacy skills as opposed to math skills, as in as you get in um, in STEM. And those jobs, if we talk about them, jobs account for a huge and growing part of the economy. Like we have mm. growing needs for people mm. in those sorts of jobs, obviously mm. for teachers, but also for healthcare workers, social mm. care workers, people whose jobs are more on the administrative side rather than perhaps the machine side, mm. um, more a bit more relational, et cetera, and requiring mm. all kinds of literacy skills, like how many, 
you can go back you, you can go back in time and find jobs we didn't really have to even to talk to somebody very much during the course mm. of the day mm. and those were very often male jobs but that's much less true now and so mm. those skills those so-called soft skills are becoming mm. more important in the labor market and that's where the jobs are coming from too yeah so um how precisely can we get boys into those jobs it's boys a bit of a and vicious young men. circle yeah, boys, I'm glad you added that. And so it's a bit of a vicious circle because as those professions either remain or in some cases be become more gender segregated, become mm. more female in orientation, mm. it's harder to persuade people. Like my, my own son mm. actually is, works in early years childcare, but, mm. but that's like, it's very hard to find male childcare workers. Mm. I was looking at the numbers mm. for, the, for the UK recently, and there were almost no male childcare workers in the UK. In fact, they mm. couldn't find a single one in the whole of Northern Ireland, not wow. one. Wow. Um, it's like literally, <laughs> literally none and very few anywhere wow. else. And so, and so it's very hard then to persuade men to go into it. So you have to reduce the stigma. But the only way to do that is, is obviously you need good role models. We need male nurses and social workers and teachers and psychologists going into schools. We need outreach mm -hmm. programs, just as we've done for women into STEM. Sure. We've, we've worked really hard to persuade girls that STEM careers are for them. We need exactly the same zeal mm -hmm. um, to persuade boys and men that those professions are the heel professions are for them but i also mm. think we probably need some more aggressive action like some scholarships specifically yeah. aimed at men sure. to go into those professions sure. just as we've done sure. for women into stem um, um in terms of because many young men and boys um will see those professions as um emasculating um so how can we get rid of that stigma yeah, well, as I said, I, to some extent, what I think we, we need some blunt policy tools to try mm. and increase male representation. So there's sure. a, a great line that like, which includes scholarships, subsidies, that's, you know, bribes, <laughs> you know, yeah. a lot of money spent on it and so on to try and just move them, get more men into them. Right. So initially, yeah. I think we're just going to have to like throw some money at that issue to get more men in. Then it'll then it, then the stigma will lessen just because there are more men. Men doing it but there's a great a great phrase in the women's movement is you have to see it to be it sure and so i just think how we present role models around that is is hugely important um and so just think about popular culture think about the ways in which sure. we depict those roles actually you know advertising and tv is actually more gender stereotypical about professions even than the real world is and i sure. think the last thing i'll say is that what we don't want to do is signal that these jobs are uh, that you, uh, somehow you know, make them seem more masculine than they really are or more feminine than they really are. We just have to be pretty straightforward sure. about it. Like nursing, nursing's a good career, hmm. um, you, know, you know, reasonably you know, secure, et cetera. We don't have to sort of go overboard in sort of making it somehow seem macho to be a nurse. Hmm. We just need to make it hmm. seem not, not, as you said, not effeminate to be hmm. a nurse. Um, yeah. And so how we talk about it is usually important. Sure. Why do we need more black men in particular to be teachers? Well, we need more men, period. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think that's important. Um, but we need more black men because there is very strong evidence that for black boys in particular, having mm. a black male teacher has some really positive effects. I would say sure. it's probably true for Hispanic boys as well in, in the uh, in the US at least. Mm -hmm. um, and there are even fewer Hispanic male teachers, actually. Lots more Hispanic okay. female teachers. Not many more mm. Hispanic uh, male teachers. Um, sure. And so I do think a kind of if we if we think about gender and race, you, know, you have you have to see it to be it, and in particular because black boys uh, are, and this is this is a big difference in the U.S. and the U.K. Actually, mm. you know, black mm. boys are the ones who are pretty much at the bottom of all of these distributions in terms of education. They are the ones who are struggling most in education, and the gender mm. gap is huge. So already mm. for every for every one college degree a black man gets, two black women get a college degree, mm. and so that you know so we're already at two to one for black men and black women. So. Uh, the gender gaps are much bigger there. And so we need a concerted focus on black boys and men in particular. In the UK, the story is st more strongly one of class and where sure. you see much more kind of class, class really plays in much more strongly. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, how would you respond to the claim made by many people that espouse what's known as um, intersectionality, um, which is that um, black women in particular um, face the most struggles in society because what you seem to be arguing is that it's actually black men and black boys 
other than black women and black girls. Uh, how would you respond to that? Uh, well, first of all, I'd just get out some charts and some data. <laughs> and I've already alluded to some of them. So, well, you're not looking at the same data as I am. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, uh, sure. black, black women in the US are more upwardly mobile out of the bottom, mm. out of the bottom, out of poverty than any other group. Um, okay. Certainly than, than and black men are the, are the least. Mm. Um, you know, black women are the bread, breadwinner in most households. I've already mentioned some mm. of the education. Actually, among young Americans, there are slightly more young black women with a postgraduate degree than young mm. white men with a postgraduate mm. degree. And so mm. there's been this extraordinary... Now, it's not to suggest that it's job done for black women, but on most of the dimensions you, you care to look at, mm. you will find that black men, black boys and men, are doing significantly worse on a lot of the measures we might care about than black mm. girls and women. That's To me, that is that is intersectionality applied mm. properly because what okay. it does is it said you can't assume that the, the, the position of one group over another is somehow fixed for all time, right? Mm. So mm. If, you, if you don't assume white always above black, mm. male always above female, straight always above gay, et cetera, because that will vary, mm. right? It will vary mm. over time mm. uh, as to what that means. Now, as a general proposition, we know that those things are kind of mostly true but then scramble sure. it up and then sure. add class, right? Mm. Scramble mm. it up. And what intersectionality does is it scrambles those categories and allows mm. you to look with more precision at particular groups. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, and and in, in terms of being fathers as well, um, can you envisage a future in which the stay at home dad um, becomes as, normalized as normalized as the stay at home mom i'll be honest and say it's hard to envisage it right now mm -hmm. but i think it's it's the the direction we should be traveling in the only thing uh, it's one of the reasons why why, I think why, why, why is why is it why is it the direction we should be traveling in um because of the evidence that fathers actually matter as much Mm. to their kids' welfare and well-being as mothers, and mm. in some ways, and in some slightly different and complementary ways, again, on average. Um, and also because, like, I, I've, I've, I tend to write about this, and do, I make this mistake, I think, in the book, too, of just looking at it through the lens of kids, right? What matters to kids, right? So fathers, I just did it then, fathers matter to mm. kids. But also sure. being a parent, mm. being an engaged parent is massively important to the identity and purpose and meaning mm. of people's mm. lives and mm. so if you deny that to anybody mm. mothers fathers except then then that's a huge loss and so i now think sure. it's actually important to think about this from the point of view uh, of men and so it, i just think as a signal also to the next generation the only caveat i'll add to that is i'm reasonably convinced by the evidence that dads really seem to come into their own in adolescence it's not that mm. they don't matter up until that point but they seem to have particular value to add uh, for teenagers Mm. Uh, and so if, if anything, it might go slightly the other way for really young kids. Mm. So like, just <laughs> to say it much more bluntly than I would kind of in the book, but it's like, all right, it's like one-year-olds might be with mum, but like 12-year-olds probably be with dad. Uh, why, why and so what that? I'd like to see is much more. Well, it seems to be that um, once you get to teenage year, your teenage years, you're sort of really pushing at the, you know, you're pushing at the envelope. You're trying to, you're taking more risks. You're going out in the world, etc. Mm. And it looks as if, again, on, whereas when you're very young, it's more about nurturing, right? So when you're really young, you just need to, right? You need nurture. You need to be kept. Like you don't mm. need to. You only need to know like two people, like one, whatever. Mm. You're not mm. out there making networks. You're not. You're not. Mm. You're not partying. Mm. Um, but as you get into teenage years, especially more deeply into adolescence you're basically learning how to grow into the world mm. and take risks. Mm. Um, and it looks as if uh, fathers uh, have some, something of a competitive advantage when it comes to mm. helping their kids learn how to, to, to manage risk, get out there mm. in the world, learn how to be more independent. Mm. And so it, you know, so it looks as if dads might be a little bit better at helping. Again, I'll simplify horribly, but it's like if mums are really good at like keeping the kids safe in the nest, Dads mm. are pretty good at helping them to successfully get out of the nest. <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. Again, these are averages, but and so what that means is that you know, parental leave should be available to both, but it should be available throughout childhood. There's a bit of an early years determinism sometimes, like it's game mm. over by five. Mm. We are learning much more that adolescence is just as important as the early years, but it's really mm. neglected in public mm. policy, and I think sometimes it's neglected by parents too.